Nobody can touch me because I would get blacklisted for that. <laughs> the persona in the front that we put forward into the universe. <laughs> You'd be standing and- Hi, I'm Gabby. Because I will miss that aspect. Something else, yeah, yeah. You're like, bitch, we're friends. <laughs> don't, don't address me like that. Well, you're people, you're not creatures, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't care if you hate me. Tis no, 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 tissue paper. I dated a lot of Sagittarius men, and that just was not working. Girls love her, boys love her. Um, and those connections and ideas change. And if we want to legalize marijuana or not, I don't know. 75% <laughs> of podcasts don't make it past the first year. Hello guys and welcome back to the Z-List Celebrities. Today I'm super excited about our guest. I have Tony joining us. Um, Tony Nage or Naj, say it again. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna get it wrong. It's Naj like massage. Naj like massage. I love that. I think that's so cool. No one gets my last name right ever, so I'm just kind of used to that. It's Mondejar and it's Hispanic, and everybody's just like Mondejar, and I'm like, that'll do. Sure, that'll do. good enough. <laughs> Well, this um, whole month series in August, as everybody who's been listening knows, is about the education system, the fun, the not fun, the exciting parts about college, um, and just education as a whole and how we're failing or how we're succeeding in education. So I'm super excited to have Tony because Tony has a great platform online talking about all things education, um, whether it be sex education, health education, all of those kinds of things, kind of putting a unique spin on how you educate your community. So tell me a little bit about your background and how you got started and all that. Um, okay. So my background, I was a philosophy major in college. So I think that anyone that is going to choose that as their vocation has a desire to question systems and to question how things are organized and how we as human beings are programming ourselves and programming each other. So I do believe that that philosophical education that I was committed to is a big part of what informs me because the thing I feel most passionate about is people being on a path of developing their own minds where they're not just accepting information that's given to them. Oh, I love that. Okay. So, and I know on social media and like you are a comedian by trade. So tell me how you've kind of taken that philosophy flown into the more comedic side of things. And then completely, I feel like changed it up with the education piece of it and your dancing videos on TikTok. Well, I think comedy at its essence is a social commentary. And even if you're watching completely absurdist commentary, uh, comedy like Tim and Eric or something, there still is a lot of social commentary embedded in it. It's just whether or not it's being like super on the nose or it's a more absurd of how people are observing culture and society. society. So I think that so, comedy and philosophy are just naturally really entwined. And it just seemed like a way of exploring ideas that was less didactic and preachy. You know, I think that nobody reacts that well when someone is like talking down to them or talking at them. And there's something about comedy that is a vulnerable and B disarming and that allows, that allows whoever is watching it to come up with their own thoughts and their own conclusions, which I think is what I'm most interested in. Well, and I really, so I actually, some background on how I found you, I was on TikTok and I actually, it was three, four months ago, um, I did a conspiracy theory and crime month because I kind of switch up months and we change our theme just because I'm a multifaceted human and I cannot stick to one theme on this podcast. So we kind of switch it up and I was doing conspiracy theories, which one of my guests to talk about is a lot of conspiracy theories are conspiracy like realist things. And um, I was on TikTok looking for different things and you were talking a lot about the government and those kinds of aspects. I know one of your recent videos even talks about the UFO situation and all that kind of change. So do you find that those videos, when you're doing that more creative dancing and that comedic style, that those videos get more of a, that attention towards the problem or the issue, or do you feel like they're focusing on the comedy aspect of it? 
Well, I think for me personally, everything that moves me to make something, I want to be provoking conversation or thought, whoever's consuming it. So, um, you know, what pleases the TikTok algorithm is a mystery that I think we all are constantly trying to chase and unravel. And I personally have just kind of, I do my best to spiritually just like let go of results and just say like, I have something to say about this topic. I want to present it in a way that's digestible and compelling to people because you know, I think a lot of education is hidden beneath complex rhetoric. So if you're going to have someone speak in a way where they're using um, terms or vocabulary or they're always just trying to prove their own intelligence, I guess, then there is this way where I feel like that can be somewhat alienating. And what I'm most interested in is packaging my thoughts in a way that's inviting people to come in, you know, and I'm not trying to prove anything to anybody. I'm actually not trying to convince anyone of anything because I'm not convinced of anything. I'm not saying that what I think is correct. I'm saying it's just what I happen to be thinking. And so what my goal is, is just to share my own, my, I'm just sharing my education. I'm just sharing my process. I'm just sharing my thoughts. And whether I even agree with myself in two months, I don't know. Sometimes yes. And sometimes mostly yes. I mostly agree with myself. I'm open to disagreeing with myself. So do you feel like TikTok has been a very good space to educate people? Or do you feel like you've found other avenues that are more valuable for education purposes? Well, TikTok, um, I think what happens in any of these platforms is you get pigeonholed into a thought process. So I have, you know, for example, I would have like 10,000 videos coming to me about manifesting for a while. And I just like couldn't get out of a manifesting algorithm. And then sometimes I'll be in an algorithm of like medicinal plants. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's cool. And medicinal plants are cool. And manifesting is cool. But are any of those ideas challenging my preconceived worldview? Like, absolutely not. They're just reinforcing it. So on the one hand, yes, like these are all opportunities for us to share information, not even necessarily each other, but just expose one another to what we are investigating, right? Because you can prove anything you want on the internet. I could prove that coffee is good for you. I could prove that coffee is bad for you. I could find studies that say this. I can find studies that say that. So I think that what I'm noticing is that we are no longer in an age of truth. We're in a post-truth age where, to me personally, intuition and gut instinct and personal excavation is the only way we're going to um, find some access to knowledge because information isn't necessarily knowledge. And can you even teach knowledge or can you only discover knowledge? Can you teach truth or can you only personally discover truth? I think that like the deep wisdom that we all are craving does not come from the chattering of others. It comes from a stillness and a silence when you are just really just like tapping into source. So everything that we're doing on like in life and on these platforms is kind of just like blah, 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 blah. And I, my only hope is that that leads people to their own stillness and their own sense of like inner knowing that is beyond anything that I could you know, say regurgitate out there. I feel like as a user, sometimes I'm so confused. Cause like you said, and like the coffee thing was a great analogy for me. I have struggled with gut issues and gut health my whole life. And I feel like every time I get on TikTok, there's a video that's saying, Oh, you need this probiotic. You need this. But then there's another video that's telling me, Oh, you could change all of that with just like diet changes. You don't need vitamins or drugs or anything like that. And then I'll get another video and it's like, well, small exercise will fix all of your problems. And it's so confusing and sometimes really overwhelming as a consumer of content because you're not really sure like what to believe is truth or not. But I like what you said about like kind of it's a post-truth era because I never thought about it that way, but it's so complicated. And so sometimes I worry about that, like younger generation that's coming up with Gen Z and generation alpha 
being able to consume that content and like not take it so seriously is kind of one of my fears, but also still be able to take something from it. I feel like that's something that I've thought about a lot recently, especially as more and more of my friends have children and they're deciding if whether or not they're going to be on social media. I feel like it's a really complex situation that like I don't have advice for people on yet. And I just am not really sure how to send people in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that, so I'm going to now reference a study. So this study that I'm referencing is almost contradicting everything I just said, but you know, you just said your gut health. Okay. So in this study, it talked about how these rabbits, I think Ohio state did the study. They talked about rabbits. They were feeding rabbits food that was like really high in cholesterol in order to test their bodies and like what was going on. And they noticed that one of the groups that was fed this really high cholesterol diet actually had like no rise in cholesterol and they were the healthiest bunnies and they were trying to figure out like what the hell happened. And they realized that the technician that was feeding these bunnies, the more poisonous cholesterol heavy food was like stroking them and petting them the whole time they were eating and like snuggling them. So the inference is, is that that loving energy that was like going into the bunnies as they were consuming the product product. meant that the bunnies were metabolizing the food different. They were digesting it different. It was like, they were taking this like semi like poisonous food and they were turning it into nutrients because of this like love and affection that was going into the bodies while they were eating. So, you know, there is such like quantum metaphysical conversations that have to happen around health and like our, our headspace, you know, like I think a lot about, um, dieting or smoking cigarettes, right? And anytime someone's smoking cigarettes, I'm like, I shouldn't be doing this. I'm like, no, you should be doing this. Love your cigarette. Bless your cigarette. Enjoy your cigarette. Be like, this cigarette is grounding me. It is bringing me medicine. Like, I think, yes, are there tons of chemicals and like factory produced tobacco? Sure. But is tobacco a beautiful plant that people have been using for medicine for thousands of years? Yes, both of those things are true. But if I am smoking and I'm feeling like guilt and fear and shame every time I smoke, that is like worse for my body than smoking and being like, I love this cigarette. You know, like I'm so happy. I'm like smoking this cigarette. Or, you know, if we're eating and we're like dieting and we're like, I shouldn't be eating this ice cream. It's like, no, fucking you want, if you're eating the ice cream, like enjoy the ice cream. I think that our headspace is so crucial to everything that we're putting in our bodies and everything that we're doing. And I know it didn't necessarily answer your question, but you did mention that no. gut health thing. And I felt like, oh, I had I should share this because I see the gut health as like this, um, what is it you can't stomach? What is going on emotionally that your stomach is like always reacting to? Could you have parasites or a thousand other things. I don't fucking know. You could examine Good. that, you know, you could try and you'd be like, am I shitting out giant dune sized worms? Like that's like, going to be that's your gonna- journey to experiment with. But, um, I think that the more we tap into like what it is, like the emotional message of our health, the emotional message of our pain, like, you know, it's like, the other day, like, the other my day, like I had a friend over and she just like walked into my chair and just like annihilated her toe, you know, and you could say, well, like, oh, I hurt my toe because I walked into a chair. Like, okay, but you hurt your toe. It's not like you're always walking in a chair. So what were you trying to learn by hurting your toe? Like, you know, feed her off in like a fear of moving forward. And she's starting high school next year. Like, of course she has a fear of moving forward. So, you know, I do think that like with all of this health all stuff, it's so stuff. overwhelming. The first step is like, what is the emotional message I'm supposed to learn? And as I'm learning that emotional message, like what other things can I experiment with to like support my health? But like you were saying, like there's like 700 bajillion things. You could take like Shiite or you can microdose, or, you know, like and then the yeah. like, Shiite is no like, longer the yeah, shit. It's no longer it's and you're just like, I don't fucking know. Just try well, it. And, and it's like, not- I feel good. I don't know. Well, and that's part of, I feel like the problem with the social media aspect is we're fed so many things that like, you don't know where to start. And sometimes it's too much. I do love that though. Cause like 
the mindset thing, that's not something I've attacked. So maybe that's my next route just because I know that sometimes, especially feeling sick all the time, I have been in a negative mind space and I feel like it doesn't matter what I'm eating, that something is hurting. And I have had body dysmorphia and like restrictive diet issues in the past. So like maybe all of those things are kind of things that I haven't reflected on. And I'm just sitting here and I'm like, oh, well, my stomach has an issue. I'm just going to eliminate things or, oh, I'm just going to try this supplement and see if that works and fixes it. But I have not addressed my head. So I don't know. I think I have some things to think about this week because I've been discussing whether or not new doctors are the answer or doing like an elimination diet again is the answer. And that hasn't worked in the past. So maybe instead of revisiting those old things, I should attack some of the mental things going on there so that's like a fantastic idea oh i, had not I can that. I say one more thing about it just because yeah. i had one more thought so um i did this video once about like eating disorders and like my experience my personal experience so i'm just sharing my personal experience but it's like i had this feeling because again this wasn't my a friend of my daughter was like kind of like going through this and i was like i was kind of remembering and thinking like what was going on with me because i was talking to her mom about it and i was like oh when my stomach was empty my mind was full because i was always thinking about what had i eaten that day what was I not going to eat that day? What was I going to eat tomorrow? What was I not going to eat tomorrow? Like I, I had this like neuro pathway of obsessing or thinking about food. And that in its own way was like a spiritual yearning to just like quiet the constant like hellacious chatter of my internal monologue. Right? So like my stomach, was empty, but my mind was full. And then as my mind was full, I wasn't like thinking about all the other shit going on in my life that was like highly problematic or causing me pain or causing me suffering or how I had no boundaries or how I was like letting these guys take advantage of me or like all the billions of things that was going on as a young woman, I wasn't addressing any of those issues. So I was just like, the food was something else to think about. And I, I do wonder, you know, with, um, cause I've experienced so much physical pain in my life, you know, and I'm like, oh, right. It's like when the physical pain is allowed in the eco chamber of the brain, then my internal monologue isn't like going through that deep emotional pain that's underneath it all because I'm not dealing with any of the issues. And then I can just like, I had this brain tumor and I was like, oh, cool. I can just be like the sick girl now. And now everyone's going to be nice to me because I'm sick. And then like, no one was nice to me and it sucked, you know? And then I'm like, oh, but I feel sick. And so that's an identity. Like there was so much wrapped into like every single major health experience I've had that was like, <laughs> I see it now or, you know, I'm like, it was, it was all a spiritual yearning, you know, in this certain sense So like, yeah, this fucking torture chamber of my mind and just like not wanting to fully deal with it. So yeah, I do think uh, the emotional headspace is a big part of all of it. And I also, sorry, last thing, that. how it's like yeah. serving you, you know? It's like, I have a friend who can never sleep and she's like, I can't sleep, I can't sleep. But it's like, if you're always tired, then you're like, well, I can't do that because I'm tired or I'm not gonna do that because I'm tired. So in a way it's like protecting you. All of these things that we're doing, they're, the objective I think is always to protect us you know, protect us from the pain, protect us from the suffering. But sometimes in that effort to protect, we are causing harm. No, I can totally see that. And it's funny. I don't think this fully relates, but it made me think about it when you said that, like, when you were at your hungriest, you were sharpest. I think there's a lot to that. And I don't know how deep that goes. And I would like definitely have to explore it more. But I don't know if you've ever heard about um, when Matthew McConaughey did the role in Dallas Buyers Club, he lost a ton of weight was like starving himself. And in his book, I believe he wrote that when he was at that weight, when he was starving himself, his mind was the sharpest to ever was and like he kind of describes it as like almost being on drugs like hyper fixated on everything because like that was the only way to ignore the hunger and he felt mm -hmm. like he was just his mentally sharpest and I just found that like so intriguing to me like I haven't done much research into it besides that but it was just wild to me that like you said like same thing you were in your head so much when you were like starving yourself or when you were hungry and how like we choose to fixate on a billion other things instead of that hunger. I think that that's like so wild that our mind has that capacity. It blows my mind, honestly. But I do feel like changing my thoughts is like the next step in that. 
Um, it's not something I had considered, but that's a great note. Let me take you on a little sidetrack though, to talk a little bit more about education. I know you've done a couple, um, little videos and stuff like that. And I don't know how deep your expertise goes on it, but sex, sex education and health. I would love to know your opinions on, do you feel like the school systems are teaching it properly? Do you feel like we're not getting enough of it? We're getting too much of it. Do you think it shouldn't be a topic? Kind of like, let me know where your thoughts and your head lies in that space. Oh God. Okay. Oh, yeah. God. So I think, um, you know, <sighs> You know, like, I think sex you education know, like, sex is so education. deeply embedded in patriarchal thought. And so one of the things that is most feared within the patriarchy is the female sexual being. You know, the mother as a sexual being, a young girl as a sexual object. Yeah. So um, an older woman, like, where does she fit into the sexual spectrum? A woman post-menopause, like all of these things, of these they're things, so heavy they're so within heavy culture and identity culture. that it's really uh, hard, it's I think, really to hard, teach I think. genuine sexual education without addressing rape culture, without addressing um, that women's value for thousands of years has been like highly embedded in her sexuality. Like if we're going to trade our commodity our of self, commodity a woman of self. Sex, obviously and her beauty has like this immense amount like of immense. monetary value because for mm -hmm. so long women were property. So teaching sexual education, like a penis goes into a vagina and then that's how a baby is made. The biology of it is one thing, but the one cultural thing, but the implications cultural of everything is like everything is where like, I think people are the most intimidated. Most intimidated. And, um, and, um, and it's really subjective. <laughs> you know, like I can, yeah. I said what I just said, and that's and not I true. Said, that's right. not a lot of people who disagree with me. So, but I so, am sure, and the one sure, thing everyone the one wouldn't disagree with is that their sexuality is subjective, it's subjective. And, mm -hmm. to teach and that subjective history of sexuality is really complicated. Um, the biology aspect it is, is its own thing, but even then it's like, how can you pull these two things apart? You know, if I, it, you know, as a kid, I remember I, just like the very basic biology of sex, sex. you know, you're like, you this is not, you're like, this is not the whole thing. This is well, and for me personally, I know when I was in high school, which was forever ago, so I don't know if they're teaching that still, but we were taught separate from the boys. Do you feel like that is something that like we should still be doing, or is that something that we should need to combine it all together? Or do you feel like men and women almost need to be educated separately and differently on those things because it's different experiences? It is different experiences, and I think it builds empathy to expose each other to different experiences. experiences. You know, so men understanding men a woman's understanding bodily experience a woman's and bodily vice versa, I think, I think would be collaborative. I, I, I don't necessarily, and also when you separate everybody, it's it heightening the sense of shame. It's heightening the sense of like, you're, you know, uh. but again, it's like, I think the, also when you separate I, again, I, I keep going back to rape, you know, and rape culture. I mean, I rape is so insidious in our culture. It's like, find me a room of five women and I, one, yep. two, three, how many of them are going to have been sexually assaulted? All five? I, you know, I would say I, all I have, five. <laughs> I know very few women who have never experienced sexual assault. Like one. I know one woman. I know one human woman who's never experienced that. And she got And married. even then, like, what is the line of sexual assault? Like, I mean, if we're talking harassment and assault to me, like, I understand that assault is more of like that physical aspect of it, but the, the harassment level, like you can't tell me that woman's never been catcalled. You can't tell me that woman's never like been said something that's violating. Like it could be so simple, like a personal experience of mine. And I've had quite a few um, situations where I would consider it sexual assault. And one for me was just an older man at a balloon festival wanting to pin something on my chest. And he stuck his whole hand up my shirt. And like, that was violating enough that like yeah. other people were like, Oh, it's not a big deal. Just let it go. He's just an old man. And I'm supposed to just let that go. Even though it made me feel a type of way that sexually was uncomfortable. 
And so I, I fully feel like there is not a woman on this planet that hasn't experienced something of like even the minor level to the highest of levels. Like I just, yeah. so I do feel like a lot of men think, oh, it's not everybody. And I feel like it's because we don't talk about it. Like I, I think I've told a handful of people that story and that's such a minor one in my story, but it's just wild how I feel like men don't think that they think it doesn't happen to everybody. It's, oh, that's like every now and then, or, oh, that's a girl at a frat party or, oh, that's this. Like they just don't. They don't get it. They just don't understand. And I don't know how to help educate them on that. Yeah. And I think that part of that is like the separation. And also it's like taking the cultural context out of sex education, you know, and I think, um, you know, women are not going to stop rape. Yeah. It has to be men on men right there. Like that has to. to, And again, it's like, um, but, you know, we are mothers and we're raising sons and our sons raise other women. So we are part of the conversation, but we're not the conversation. You know, we are part. It's a it's a collaborative effort, you know. And I think that, like, the raping of children, the raping of children, women, the raping of other men, the raping of the planet, you know, the raping of gender. Like, all, rape is part of, like, how we're treating each other and the planet and everything. And... I don't think that's talked about enough. I surely don't think that's explored enough. But then, enough. you know, it's then, like, um, you know, of course, there is this fear, you know, well, how to talk about this with children? At what point do you start discussing this? At what point are you taking away their quote unquote innocence? Yet, if children mm-hmm. don't know how to protect children themselves, don't if children don't know what is appropriate, what is not, how many times are they violated and their innocence violated. is taken from them from a lack of education and they're afraid and they don't know how to tell anybody and they don't know how to defend their bodies and they don't know how to say no and they don't know how to like make a huge fuss. So like fuss. whatever is happening in the moment stops. Like, Stop. so it's dangerous. It's more dangerous, I believe, to not talk about it than to talk about it. And as a parent, you know, like I understand the complexity of conversations, but I mean, my kid is... 13 she still plays with dolls you know she's plenty innocent she still has like her imagination going and like we've definitely had lots of difficult conversations you know so for my when I feel like experience I don't think it has to take their innocence away well and I feel like a lot and I am not a parent so like I don't have that perspective I hope to one day have that perspective but I do feel like just as a human being I feel like parents that are so upset that they're like no I don't want to I want like to have that conversation with my kid at my time not the school system doing that things like that I feel like at this point in time the school system isn't doing it any earlier than necessary to the point where it's like why haven't you had that conversation with your child yet like if you have to worry about them going out into the world by themselves they need to understand what's inappropriate what is not something that they should be engaging with with adults things like that. I also like start to worry about I'm very invested in a lot of the human trafficking issues a lot of the abuse issues that happen within school systems that kind of ride by because children assume, oh, this is an authority figure. This is okay because their parents haven't told them, hey, this is inappropriate. This is not okay. And they just assume that this school is a safe space when many schools are very much not a safe space anymore. So I feel like that's another aspect in layer two of it's not just sex education to talk about the two teenagers having sex in the back of the car. It's sex education to prevent from really harmful things happening to children. And I feel like that's not something that anybody wants to address when this conversation of sex education comes up for school systems. So I feel like that's another issue, especially with government involvement as well. And them deciding, oh, hey, this is what should be said and this what shouldn't be said but they're not educators. How do you feel about like the difference between government involvement and like how educators feel about how school systems should be run? Well, anything that's well, going anything to have that's political to involvement has a political agenda. Like mm-hmm. these aren't um, benign forces, benign you know, forces. these are like people and institutions and systems and thought processes that have an agenda. agenda. And that agenda is not to serve you. And that agenda is not like for the betterment of mankind. I think that's, I mean, I I don't want to say it's obvious, but I think it's definitely worth exploring. If you do not think that, like explore, you know, (laughs) use your gut instincts. Like what is, is, are these systems really here to serve me and to serve others? So 
And then again, it's like, but I, of course, you know, you have public educational systems that are funded, you know, by the government, which is ultimately funded by our tax dollars. So really it should be the public's decision because we're the ones ultimately funding this. I mean, the government is just allocating funds. And, you know, I, I personally would want more funds going to educational systems and less funds going to war, you know? So we don't even get a say to like how our tax dollars are allocated, except for whatever false promises our politicians give us. So I think like a, the complexity could be really mitigated by also just like really kind of diving into body autonomy and body autonomy and really body threatens autonomy. the status quo and it really threatens political systems. But if like we were to just go from the most like base, like benign beginning of education, it's like your body means it's your body. You choose what happens to your body. You have autonomy over your body. And then that brings up, of course, all sorts of other conversations around body autonomy that have become politicized. Do you feel like, and I feel like I, and I might be on a weird side of TikTok, like everything is an algorithm, I know, but do you feel like you're seeing a rise in a lot of people choosing to homeschool? And do you feel like that we're going to shift into an era here soon where like more parents are taking control of their kids' education and we see less public school kids? I mean, I think homeschooling I mean, I is um, um, a really like interesting and beautiful thing to explore, you know, but it takes a, a parent like being home to do that you know like yeah. not every household has that as a possibility but I, you know I, I see yeah I see all those videos too like unschooling kids and they're like living on vans and they're blonde and gorgeous and like jumping off of rocks and it looks so free like little Peter Pan kids you know and you're like that looks rad so you know I think as a possibility you know if that works for you like great but I think the majority of people in a capitalist system are, you know, reliant so on school as a means to have their kid have a place to go while they're at work, you know, like that's part of it. That's part and of it. And so I, I, as much as I love the revolution of what's going on with like taking education in your own hand, I also think there needs to be an equal revolution of how, you know, public education is being offered. So do you at this point feel like the education system that we have is built to hurt us or help us? Oh, I, my personal belief is that the educational is system the educational is basically system. built to make us smart enough to work for these companies, but not smart enough to question it. I mean, I think that's, um, I'm not the only person who I'm thinks that, you know, so I do not think our educational system is designed to uh, for us to like really explore our deepest intelligence. There's no way, you know, there's just truly no way that could even be claimed, even private schools. I, I mean, I had the privilege to go to a private school and um, that education was kind of garbage in many ways. Like I like the way I was taught about the Civil War, complete garbage. You know, the way I was taught about a lot of historical things was like absolute propaganda, you know, so we are taught propaganda. I mean, like I went on this whole thing about the medical industrial complex and how John D. Rockefeller basically Rockefeller. created all these petrochemicals to revolutionize in the more negative way, our medical system. And the way he was able to do that was he gave massive grants to Harvard, to Yale, to these institutions and said, here's like a ton of money and you're going to teach my curriculum. And my curriculum involves this kind of petrochemical based medicine that's going to benefit that's my companies. And like, that happens all the time. There are the way that massive universities get, you know, giant endowments from people who have an agenda of shaping education. So it benefits their business. I mean, that is a, that is, a, that is happening. So then what's your opinion on traditional schooling routes, such as college? We're not talking necessarily like, you know, pre-education with high school and elementary school, but starting college, do you feel like college is a necessity for those who want to be functional and successful members of society, or do you feel like we're kind of doing away with that? Well, I think there was this like very interesting movement in like the late nineties, early two thousands where college, we maybe even starting in the eighties with like revenge of the nerds and these films where college became this rite of passage for like partying, mm -hmm. you know, and college wasn't, 
seen as like a privilege of higher education for you to advance your thoughts, you know? And I think that was like very intentional from a perspective of like making everybody feel like they had to go to college in order to like experience the American dream of whatever sort. And that your time at college was about partying and fucking, which is just like, it's so ironic because you're going into debt to party yeah. and fuck strangers. Like, strangers, like, no, I think that yeah. the reason why college is so important from an economic standpoint in this capitalist system is for people to be in debt. And then once you are mm -hmm. in debt, you are going to get jobs that you do not like in order to crawl out of debt. You are going to major in business. You are going to major in marketing. You're going to major in the economic system in order for you to get ahead because you're in debt at $80,000. You're not going to explore philosophy. You're not going to explore art. You're not going to explore questioning culture. You're going to be buried in debt. And like debt in terms of the stock market has plenty of value. The college debts are the only debts that are not forgiven after you die. And Joe Biden voted for that. You know, like these are these college debts, like the way that they've basically created you to be um, like, a, a slave servant. to the system. Yeah, like, a, like I'm like I hate that word, but you are an indentured servant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So. Uh, so. Yeah. Like, but, yeah. but, and, and, you know, the way that college and that experience can help can you kind of learn how to organize your time, help you learn how to deal with pressure, help you learn how to work with other people, help you learn how to write. Like there are plenty of skills I learned in college that have been applicable to me as like a small business owner or like um, as a comedian, like how much I have to hustle. Like I have great time management. I have like a very developed executive function you know like i can produce i can parent i can do a lot of things and I, i'm sure that my experience in college because i took it seriously is part of like why i am able to you know manage multiple things and ideas within this like capitalist hellscape that we live in so yeah. th that could just be my brain maybe i would have been fine just like zippity zopping on the internet but i don't i don't know i don't know i i, th I think that it's a scam. And I also think that it has value. It depends, well, I on, feel how like you, from, it depends on how you approach it too. Exactly. And I was going to say from the opposite perspective, I definitely am not the same person I was in college. I did go with that mindset. We all have to go to college. My parents want me to go to college. That's the American dream. That's what I'm supposed to do. I went to college. I definitely, the two episodes before you were actually about Bama rush and sororities and like that aspect of life and that partying side of life. Um, and I was in a sorority. I did all of those things. And I feel like for me now, I work in marketing for the most part, a lot of social media stuff, but like my career up until I took on my own business was all marketing, social media, things that were self-taught or taught on the job. And my major was law. Like I was going to law school. I was like ready to do all of those things and completely left college and started a whole new career that I didn't have an education for. So I feel like for me, it wasn't that college was a waste. I, like you said, learned a lot of time management, other things like that. I learned how to live on my own as an adult because, you know, I hadn't done that. And I lived in a household where like everything was taken care of for me. So it was very beneficial for me to like start the adult steps with a little bit of guidance still. But it definitely was more the aspect of like, I do feel like some of that was such a waste in life because it was, and I graduated quickly. So I at least don't have to say, oh, I'm in four years of college debt. I graduated in two years, but I just felt like, those two years were spent doing a lot of things that like I had a lot of fun doing. It was a great time. They're great memories, but it wasn't pushing me further. It wasn't until after that graduation date where I started a whole new career path that I started to learn. So to me, it felt like kind of like two years of just fun, which is fine to have in your early twenties. There's nothing wrong with that, but I do feel like that the education was not there for me. Like I needed it to be. And like, that was coming from a space of like, I got a minor in Spanish. I got a minor in finance. I feel like I literally learned nothing in that finance minor, except for like 
things that I don't use, like business finance that unless you're going to be an accountant or a financial advisor didn't matter. And I felt like there could have been classes that were more life skills on how to manage my finances, credit, things like that, that weren't taught. So I feel like college has its value if it's going to provide education for the real student in the real world. Whereas I feel like a lot of those majors and minors don't. So I think that's where I struggled with feeling like college was beneficial, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's like the way our system works is that you need the majority of the population to just have a job. Mm -hmm. And that they're just like they every CEO needs workers, you know. So if if no one wants to be a worker, then what? Exactly. So I, I can see how that's kind of going to maybe transition. I feel like I'm so intrigued to see how Gen Z, I feel like a lot of them are choosing not to go to college or they're just going straight into interning, things like that. So I'm curious to see if that changes and we actually see a decrease in college admittance or actual numbers, but I'm not sure what turn that's going to take. Do you have an opinion on Gen Z and Generation Alpha? Do you feel like they're going to change the world in a good way for us? Do you feel like they're still in like this learning phase? I don't know. I feel like the generations I know can be like a complicated thing, like millennials versus Gen Z, I feel like is always a battle between everybody on the internet. But I do feel like they've shown different like values in their humor, how they handle things online and like how they're choosing to educate themselves. Do you feel like you're seeing a difference with that generation to come? And do you feel like you're excited for it or kind of nervous about it? I mean, I think every generation has this kind of way of looking at the people coming as if it's completely out of context. You know, mm -hmm. th there is a genuine context for every single you know, generational difference that comes that is to me more interesting to more explore interesting rather than, more. you know, pointing one's finger at a generation and, and judging it because, you know, um, has there, I think with parenting, so generations come from parents, right? And each parent has its own cultural lexicon of which they are pulling information, wisdom, knowledge about how to parent their children. And how you parent is going to very much impact how your child behaves in society. So, you know, a lot of parents are parenting their own inner child. They're not necessarily They're not parenting necessarily. their child. They're parenting in reaction to how they were parented. And until we as a, you know, collective culture really deal with trauma, and how we were traumatized and how our parents were traumatized and to what context was their trauma informing their traumatizing, right? All of this intergenerational trauma that we have been experiencing for thousands of years, like the only way to truly progress, which I think everyone kind of is, like society is moving towards like a greater emotional maturity. I do see that. Like, I think I'm infinitely more emotionally mature than my grandmother, you know, from the greatest generation <laughs> who was very uh, emotionally uh, stunted. But there was a context of where that came from. So to me, the conversation around parenting is really a conversation about healing trauma and how to have conversations in the flesh with your children about your trauma and how you are impacting them in real time, you know, not just waiting for them to be 30 and then be like, so what happened? You know, you cool? <laughs> like, I think <laughs> there needs to be like, kind of like checking in, not checking as if your in. child is going to be directing, you know, how you parent. You're the parent. You have to, you have to examine that. But every year I'm like noticing different things about my kid. I'm like, oh, I see how I contributed to that, <laughs> you know, that part. And like, hmm, what is it that I can do differently in order to, um, you know, be of service to her as a human? Because I'm programming her. I am the programmer. So I better evaluate my programming annually, if not seasonally. Well, and it's, it's so true that like, we are a product of our parents and like, there's all these sayings to associate that, like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So you almost, I feel like 
there should be more education and encouragement for parents to work on themselves to be better for their kids. And I feel like sometimes parents and just seeing a lot of my friends becoming parents, they lose themselves in this new child, which I know is a natural thing that happens. But like my fear for like parents is that as you lose yourself or change who you are or not give yourself that time and self-care and love that you need to be a better parent, your kid's going to pick that up and take that with them, which I think is like a huge issue that I see a lot in today. And I feel like we're getting better at it, but I still feel like there's a lot of people that don't take the time to themselves to make themselves a better parent. They think that they can just, I feel like the lack of ability for people to realize that like kids see more and understand more than like what you just say to them. So if they see bad behaviors, they're still picking up on it, even if you're not teaching them the bad behaviors. So I feel like that shift needs to happen as well for new parents or they're still going to pick up on those bad habits and complete it. So I feel like I'm hoping for Generation Z, Alpha, the ones to come that like maybe that's something where they're also taught to, hey, you don't have to like act specifically like your parents if that's something that those parents aren't being responsible to do, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's a spiritual journey that one goes through, you know, as you're kind of looking later on in life, like what happened? Mm -hmm. Why am I the way I am? I think most people in their teens or their 20s start to question and start to investigate, you know, like what's going on with them and how they are and how their parents contributed to them and how they are and to what level do we have understanding and forgiveness and unconditional love for all that. But, you know, I think what you're saying um, around losing oneself in parenting as like a role or as a journey, again, this for me personally, I think like that goes back to identity, sense of self, and again, the spiritual mm -hmm. hellscape of one's own mind. So if you are constantly occupying your thoughts with your child and you have them on your mind constantly, then it's a it's a great neural pathway to not have to think about yourself or to think about your own issues or to do the uncomfortable emotional work that's always the lava underneath the surface of your, you know, human state. Like I, I think most yeah. of us are just constantly fucking healing, self-reflecting, you know, um, avoiding pain, et cetera, et cetera. So when we make our children our worlds completely, it's a way of avoiding ourselves, you know? And I think that that is a, that's a spiritual journey of like why we avoid our emotional pain to such an extreme extent, because like we don't have the tools, we don't have the support, we don't have the um, experience, we don't have the practice of like, okay, I got to go into my emotional pain. Like my child is everything to me. And yet I have to, you know, I should think about them a certain percentage of every day in order to be like a present, you know, meaningful force in their life. But if I'm thinking about them 90% of my day, then like I'm using them. I'm using them to not think about the things I don't want to think about. That's a great way to look at it too. It's like, it's using your child, which we don't want to use other human beings. I like that. I never thought about it that way either, but you, that with lovers, you, will say, right? you know, when you're obsessing about a lover, you're using that person. Yeah. They're not asking to be on your fucking mind all day. You know, like no, actually no one is asking to be on your mind all day. So anytime someone is on your mind all day, you are using them. You are using them. You know, you it's do. very much obsessive compulsive disorder, which is like we recognize as, you know, something that needs to be almost treated in a sense. So if you feel like that in your head, that's got to be a, a toxic situation for your whole body too. kind of brings us back to the beginning where you talked about how your thoughts like dictate your overall being and your overall body. Like that fear then becomes if you're obsessing about that one little thing all the time, like that has to emotionally affect your body as well. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And of course, it's like when you first have a kid, they are on your mind a lot because they're fucking attached to you. Yeah, you know, like you can have a baby attached to you and breastfeeding or all those things and yet still, you know, explore your own spiritual domain and your own emotional domain. Like you can, you have, and it's, I, I've been there, like I've done all of this, like I understand, but I do think it's like um, the lack, it's like we lack so much control over our thoughts we don't work out our minds, you know, we work out our bodies all the time, you know, but like, do you work out your mind on how, how to like have, 
I mean, can you ever control your thoughts? I don't think so. I mean, I don't even think the monks are telling you you can control your thoughts, but you can be a witness to your thoughts, but you can practice, you know, observing one's thoughts. So you will be in the practice. That's why they call meditation a meditation practice. They don't call it a meditation completed form, you know, like nobody yeah. is just like sitting there and like, oh, my, my mind is empty. Perfect. You know, it's like, no, 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 no. You're practicing observing your thoughts. Well, and I feel like a lot of people might have like familiar processes with that, especially if you practice yoga, because I know in yoga, there's a lot of whole like silence your mind vibes, but um, I'm sure you're familiar with the book. But one of my favorite books is The Power of Now and how it talks about that little voice in your head that like it's literally a subconscious reflection of you, but it's not you. And I think that that was like a huge awakening for me when I was like, oh, okay, that voice in my head is not actually me talking. It's like the worst of my thoughts. And being able to silence that voice, they talk about how it literally takes years. It takes practice to be able to shut that voice up and to actually have no voice in there and just conscious thought. And I just think that it's so and wild how some people ever, can do it. You don't shut that voice up. You just stop putting value to it. It's still going. Exactly. Right. It's, it goes. <laughs> it will go. And then the best you can hope for is like, the deeper mantras or the deeper wisdom that is louder than it. But this will continue. This is your, your ego is your life. This is you, you yeah. know, it's, it keeps going. So even the rhetoric, they're going to silence that. It's like, no, you're not. That's why some people give up meditation. They're like, well, I can't, I can't stop thinking. You know, it's like, yeah, everyone, everyone does that. You just have to pay less attention to it, but it's not going to shut up because it only yeah, shuts up in the yeah, exactly. You're completely correct. And I think that that's something that creates, I feel like meditation, especially in social media culture, like it's getting more like legs and we're seeing it walk around and like doing its thing and people are starting to pay attention to like meditation and things like that. But I feel like definitely I can see what you're saying and there's some unrealistic expectations and why people would stop and quit because quite literally it's, it's something that people are saying they've mastered or they want to teach it to you. And it makes you feel like you're never going to get there. And I'm like, this is exhausting. Life is exhausting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, literally Buddhist monks spend 30 years in a cave and I don't even think they're coming out claiming like, oh, I'm a silent mind, you know, no one that's enlightened is claiming like, oh, I'm enlightened all the time. No, it's a, it's a moment. It's a moment of clarity that then is gone in an instant. You know, it's not like anyone's walking around in a pure state of enlightenment all the time. Like that's not the claim. Yeah. It's, yeah. a moment of clarity that one would receive, you know, I, I think that like meditation has been taken so far out of the context of like traditional Buddhist teachings, Ayurvedic teachings, tantric teachings, all of these things that are like the deep studies. I mean, you want to study something, Jesus Christ, you can spend the next 70 years studying Tantra and you still won't get it. You know, you'll sort of kind of get it maybe if you really devote every fucking second to it. This is complicated shit. No. And I, in whether it's Tantra meditation, I've like touched on all of it, but it's so deep that I'm like, do I continue to like pick that and explore that for the rest of my life and not get to explore all the rest? Or do I kind of spread the wealth and kind of learn about the core principles and beings of all of them that can benefit my life versus that deep diving that I feel like sometimes we're encouraged to do, but don't have the time or energy in our day to do. So I can well, definitely be a see life that. Commitment. Yeah. You would commit your life to that, to the holy life of like being a monk or a nun or whatever, you know, and most of us <laughs> don't have most of our calling. goals. Yeah. Most of us just don't have that calling or that discipline or that desire. You know, you have to be committed to doing that. Exactly. Well, I know we're wrapping up on time here, but I wanted to like, just ask you like one final education question. Um, just like format, let's, let's say you're sitting there and you're talking to your child. What's an expectation as a parent or as somebody younger listening to this that you would say going into school, whether it's public school, private school, college, what's an expectation you want to ingrain in people? That's basically like, Get your education, do these things, but remember your core principles of who you are. What would that advice be that you would give to somebody to not get lost in education as it's structured today? I think it's to learn how to learn. The The, the journey is a journey. Like education isn't a means to it. Education, education is not 
an end, you know, it, it, it is an end. I'm sorry. It's not a means to an end. Like education is the end in and of itself. It's not a means to an end. So what I mean by that, if that's confusing, is that what you're learning is less significant to how you are learning. Because what we're learning as if anyone who studies science or math or history or English or anything knows that it's constantly changing. It's constantly in flux. We're constantly getting more information that changes the information we thought we had. So information is not knowledge. Information is just information up to now. And knowledge, like true knowledge comes from tuning into the self. And so we already have all the secrets of the universe in our universe, consciousness. In our- you have them, I have them, Einstein has them, anyone has them, okay? What our capacity to tap into the the wisdom of all things, the that's, of all the, things. That's, the, that's the variety. But do you, we all have the wisdom. We all have the wisdom. I think that's very important to remember. Like the deep wisdom that comes like beyond language, everybody has. So while we're in this like paradigm of like speaking and communicating and working and being a capitalist and et cetera, et cetera, the best thing you could do is recognize that that. learning how to learn is what you need to do. What you're learning is is going to to learn. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Tony. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. I'm going to make sure I link in the bio for everybody, your information, how to find you, make sure to follow Tony and get all the education that you need from her. Um, I hope to see lots more health videos from you. I will have to connect with you personally on that gut and mind situation that we got to work out over on this body. So I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Hey, thank you for having me.